very much, uh, Sumanta, for the um, uh, uh, invitation and for the introduction. Um, as as, <coughs> as Sumanta said, um, um, I am in Louisiana State University. <coughs> I am not from the U.S. originally, um, as you can tell from my accent. Uh, I am from Spain, but I I work here in the U.S. Um, is there any any question or? Uh, I think there was some uh, mute and mute issue, so please go ahead. Okay, okay. okay. So um, I was asked to give a talk, and I was wondering which topic to to describe. So uh, I choose this topic: Hawking radiation in analog uh, systems or analog Hawking radiation, because I was told that there are many students in this audience. So I thought that this is a topic which is kind of. Uh, Curious and interesting and well sweet, well uh, uh, suited uh, uh, to discuss with the students, um, and also because there are many students, I will uh, have a very pedagogical tone. So if you have technical questions, uh, by any means, please stop me and and ask me. Um, so uh, all, what I want to say uh, is written here uh, uh, in this paper that I recently wrote with two of my students here in, in, in LSU, and I invite you to, to check it if you want to know more details. Um, uh, so let me start uh, briefly talking about the Hawking effect on black holes. Um, 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 I have also been told that the audience is very broad, so, so uh, I don't know if everybody is, 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 is uh, familiar with this topic, but I will give a, a summary. So I apologize for the experts in the in the audience. So you know, black holes are these uh, really mysterious and fascinating uh, objects that appear in both in science fiction books and in physics books, and that is really really nice. And uh, from the physics perspective, they are solutions to Einstein equations, and we have evidence that they are real objects in the in the sky, and. At the mathematical level, they are very interesting because they, they, you know, they are extremely elegant from the mathematical viewpoint. Uh, 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 there is enough material here to give an entire talk about the properties of a black hole, but just let me emphasize one thing that I think is quite, quite amazing. So, so you know the, uh, very well the laws of thermodynamics that are here, the, the, th the three laws. Uh, uh, a body in equilibrium has a, a, a constant temperature, energy is conserved, and entropy uh, never decreases. Well, these are laws, laws of physics, uh, uh, experimentally tested. It happens that if you go to general relativity and you study uh, um, the properties of a black hole, there are analogs to each of these laws, but they are rather uh, theorems in general relativity. The first law, the zero law, sorry, is that uh, black holes in equilibrium, they have a magnitude called the surface gravity, which tells you what is the intensity of gravity on the surface of the horizon, which remains constant in equilibrium. Energy is conserved, the mass of the black hole is the energy, and there is a first law of thermodynamics having to do with the area, the charge of the black hole, and the angular momentum. And the area never decreases in any process. And again, these are theorems in, in, in GR. And, and you know, the, the analogy uh, may tell you that these are actually, uh, this is not only a mathematical analogy, it's a physical analogy because, you know, it is really compelling. But initially it was thought that this can never be a physical analogy. Why? Because a black hole uh, can only, a classical black hole, can only absorb radiation and cannot emit anything. So, so it can never be in equilibrium with a thermal uh, uh, resource, right? If you put it in an oven, it will absorb heat, but will never emit anything because it's black. So no black body radiation for a, for a black hole. Therefore, this can only be a mathematical analogy and, only, and not a physical analogy as one could, could desire. But as you may know, this situation changed radically with the contribution of this uh, amazing uh, gentleman, uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. 
uh, who realize that when you go a step beyond GR and you put quantum mechanics, so you, you put H bar on the problem, black holes, and you study quantum fields propagating on, a, on, a, on, on, on the top of a, of a black hole or close to it, Hawking realizes that the presence of the event horizon makes the vacuum of quantum fields unstable. And that vacuum decays in pairs of, of, of particles, one that goes inside the black hole and the other that escapes to infinity. And it happens that the radiation that goes to infinity, is called Hawking radiation, has precisely a black body spectrum. And with a temperature that makes this analogy between uh, GR uh, loss uh, uh, theorems and loss of thermodynamics completely uh, closed. So uh, therefore, thanks to Hawking and this amazing observation, now we believe that these are actually the physical uh, loss of thermodynamics of black holes. And black holes are not black, uh, uh, but they rather emit thermal radiation and therefore they lose mass and finally evaporate. And this is a completely astonishing and amazing uh, uh, property. Uh, 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 this relation between causal horizons and thermodynamics. And it becomes even more amazing if you look at the, the expression for the temperature of a black hole, the Hawking temperature, because it really contains all the fundamental constant of nature, H bar, speed of light, gravity, and the, the Boltzmann constant in a single formula. And of course, the properties of the black hole, which is just the mass. So, so this is one of the most beautiful expressions that, that I have ever found in, in physics. Okay, this is about astrophysical black holes. But now let me go a step beyond and speak about analog black holes and Hawking radiation. And uh, as many of you may know, uh, the next chapter in this story was written by Bill Unruh, who realized that uh, uh, you know, this relation between causal horizons and thermodynamics and, 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 uh, and hot bodies is not intrinsic or is not unique to astrophysical black holes, but this relation is way more general. And in fact, he showed it uh, using fluids. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I mean, let me describe what happens in a fluid uh, uh, with a picture. I apologize for, for you know, the low quality of the picture. It's obvious I made it by hand. Uh, so this picture uh, uh, shows a pipe, the, uh, a pipe with a fluid, it can be water, for instance. And you know, a fluid runs from the right to the left. And uh, Vs is the speed of sound, the speed of sound uh, waves along the fluid as measured by a lab frame. And Bf is the speed of the fluid. So on the right, the fluid is slow compared to the speed of, of sound, uh, but we can shrink the pipe. And if we shrink the pipe, the velocity will increase. And I'm gonna shrink it enough that the velocity of the fluid is larger than the speed of sound here. And then I, uh, the pipe increases again and the speed is, is, is lower again. Then what is interesting is what happens if you now consider sound waves, you know, this, uh, this uh, means uh, uh, the wave front of a sound wave emitted here. And the sound, the, the front is distorted to the left because the fluid is moving. So the fluid is dragging the sound. So the, the sound propagates faster to the left than to the right. Uh, so if you have a microphone here, uh, you will listen uh, 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 this sound arriving to you, but it goes faster to the right, to the left. Uh, but that is not true if you emit the sound in the middle. If you emit the sound in the middle, because the fluid flows faster than the sound, the sound will be dragged. And this is a one-way propagation. Sound cannot be propagated to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the right because the fluid drags the sound. But if you think a little bit, you know, then this line 
where the this is the line where the speed of the fluid equals the speed of, of, of sound acts like a black hole horizon because sound cannot exit cannot propagate to the right of this vertical line can only propagate to the left so this is the analog of a black hole so this is a sound horizon sonic horizon and for the same reason this other barrier where the speed of the fluid again equals the speed of sound uh, is such that waves can only propagate to the left so oops sorry sorry uh, uh, so uh, waves cannot enter this barrier and this acts like a like the time time inverse of a black hole this is a white hole so here not you can enter but nothing can exit here you can exit but nothing can enter black hole horizon white hole horizon what Ulru uh, pointed out is that if you study now the sound propagating here you will find the same equations as hawking hawking found for the astrophysical case and therefore hawking conclusions also apply here namely a black hole this black hole should emit thermal uh, you know pairs of particles and uh, uh, the radiation going to the right should have a thermal black body spectrum so a spontaneous particle creation, particle emission for this black hole with a thermal spectrum and a well-defined temperature. And the same for the white hole with, with a few differences because this is a black hole and this is a white hole. So, so the, the, the message here is that this Hawking effect is not unique for astrophysical objects, black holes, but rather is a generic uh, uh, effect. Any causal barrier uh, with waves propagating thereon, should emit uh, Hawking radiation. There is a question there. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Sham. Uh, uh, this effect that you're describing is entirely classical, right? No, this is a quantum effect, as I will describe in a second. But the picture you are shown is only classical. The picture is classical, but the radiation is quantum radiation. In fact, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, you know, imagine that, I mean, maybe I should explain it better. Uh, if you put sound waves in the vacuum, so no sound, sound waves, only vacuum fluctuations, then Hawking tells you that spontaneously from the vacuum, uh, uh, pairs of phonons will appear and they are quantum mechanically entangled. Okay. So, uh, two quantum effects here. One, it is originated from the vacuum. So sound waves start in the vacuum. And, and, and of course, classically, if you start with the vacuum, you remain in the vacuum because the classical vacuum is zero. There is nothing there. But quantum mechanically, you have um, uh, uh, quantum fluctuations. And this horizon is able to transform quantum vacuum fluctuations into pairs of quanta, which are quantum mechanically entangled. They are, in fact, maximally entangled, as I will describe uh, in okay. a second. So this is this is fully Thanks. quantum. Um, there is another question. Yeah, um, may, may I ask? So uh, just a quick question regarding how, uh, in this case, if you want to compare it to a, a astrophysical black hole, the background fluid is flowing. So this is not equilibrium in some sense, right? Is that uh, is that ever an issue in the comparison or? No, it's not. I mean, um, it's not an issue. Of course, you are completely right. There are differences because, because the chisms are not the same. So, uh, uh, but, but there is a close analogy and there is a sense in which this is exactly Hawking radiation. Um, uh, in the example, I'm going to focus, which is optical black holes. Um, uh, you are going to see that there is a reference frame in which the black hole is at rest and, 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 and there is nothing. Uh, but you are completely right. There are differences. Uh, each system is, is different and you have different properties. But, but, but this, the message is that the relation between causal horizons and the quantum emission of thermal uh, radiation uh, uh, is, is universal. That is the statement. This is what we are looking after. Okay, 
now let me go to 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 optical analogs because uh, uh, these analog black holes can also be created with optics and let me show how so this uh, now this is not a pipe but rather a, a optical fiber or a crystal and now i put a strong pulse this is a pulse of radiation propagating inside and i'm going to consider weak pulses propagating on the top of that. So these weak pulses are my props, are what I want to use as, as the analog of phonons uh, in the previous example. Uh, uh, and this guy is going to create this po a strong pulse is going to create the black hole. Why it, this can create an analog black hole white hole? Because there is something called the Kerr effect that tells you that if you are in a crystal, uh, the presence of a strong pulse can modify the index of refraction. So the index of refraction that this uh, weak pulse feels is not only n, the, the index of the crystal, but has a modification proportional to the intensity of this guy. So this big guy can slow down the weak props in such a way that when this weak prop initially faster than the pulse, uh, approaches the pulse, it slows down and can never, oops, sorry, and can never enter this surface. So now if you, if we change the frame and we sit on the top of the pulse, so we go to a co-moving frame, then this guy, this, this vertical line acts as a white hole horizon. Weak props cannot enter here because they are slowed down by the pulse. So if you are sitting on the top of the pulse, you will see that the back, uh, the rear part acts as a white hole and the front part acts as a black hole uh, horizon. Uh, 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 everything can enter, but nothing can exit because they are not fast enough. Uh, uh, uh. So using this curve effect, one can create optical analogs of white holes and black hole pairs co-moving with the pulse. So from now, from now on, I'm gonna sit down uh, on the top of the pulse. So I'm going to be in a co-moving frame where the horizons are at rest. And again, uh, 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 Asunru and Hawking pointed out this uh, black hole will emit a Hawking pairs of entangled particles. And this white hole will emit Hawking pairs of entangled particles. Uh, uh, again, Hawking effect. And the temperature is given by the properties of the pulse, by essentially by the slope slope of this of this curve uh, at the horizon uh, so that is the analog of the Hawking temperature so quite amazing that this this uh, these horizons uh, 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 emit uh, uh, thermal radiation you know it's, it's not any kind of radiation it's exactly black body spectrum and, and... but the problem with this the problem is that this Hawking radiation the temperature the Hawking temperature is so low that is very difficult to observe. It is very challenging because any thermal noise uh, overshines uh, the Hawking radiation. And there is only one group who has claimed uh, uh, the observation of Hawking radiation, the group of Jeff uh, Eisenhower. He uses Bose-Einstein condensates and phonons in Bose-Einstein condensates. But, but because it's the only group claiming, claiming that uh, the community is really awaiting for confirmation and, and, and the confirmation has not appeared uh, uh, yet. Um, but then given, you know, given the difficulty in observing the spontaneous Hawking radiation, the Hawking radiation originated from the vacuum, people came with the idea of stimulated Hawking radiation. And as you could guess, this is very similar to the quantum mechanics uh, stimulated versus spontaneous. And the statement is that a spontaneous effect is that phonons or, or, or these props start in the vacuum and the horizon emits uh, radiation. A stimulated is that now you stimulate the process by illuminating either the black hole or the white hole with radiation. And then it happens, uh, and we know it from quantum mechanics, that more Hawking radiation is generated. You can amplify the intensity of the Hawking radiation by stimulating it. Uh, so, wow, this is a nice idea. Maybe 
you know, this stimulated process can help us to increase the intensity, to increase the brightness of the Hawking effect and obs observe it in the lab. Uh, so, so several people did experiments. Unrus, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Unrus group with water and Professor Leonhard group with optical analogs. And they did measure uh, stimulated Hawking radiation with water and with optical radiation, with optical analogs. So with a fluid analog and with an optical analog. However, and this goes back to the, to the good question that I had yet, uh, before. Uh, uh, these authors argued that the stimulated process has nothing quantum on it. The spontaneous obviously has, because the spontaneous comes from the vacuum. But they said that the stimulated process can be explained using classical waves. It's just a scattering of classical waves. So it's nice that you can see that. <laughs> but people consider that is not a confirmation of the Hawking effect, of the quantumness of the Hawking effect. And this is clearly agreed on this on these papers by the authors themselves. So this is a pity, right? Because we can measure this Hawking radiation, <laughs> stimulate it, but, 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 but we cannot confirm it is really quantum. Uh, uh, so it was very promising, but, 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 but we have this issue. This is where we want to contribute now. So our question, and this is what I want to explain, is the following. First of all, what is quantum and what is classical in the Hawking effect? I am coming back to the, to the question before, uh, uh, which is a good question. And once we understand that, I want to go beyond uh, previous experiments and ask if there is a way to amplify the quantum aspects of the Hawking radiation not only the classical intensities, but also whatever is quantum. If I can stimulate, if there is a way to stimulate the quantumness of the Hawking effect, if that is possible, that will make the stimulated process a very promising avenue to experimentally test uh, Hawking and Unruh's uh, idea. So that is the goal that they want to make. So I'm going to, uh, uh, just for pedagogical reasons, I'm going to give you the results in pieces, like uh, you know, contribution one, contribution two, et cetera, because I think it's more clear, logical in that way. So the first contribution is that we build an analytical model to, to be able to think uh, uh, easier about the process by mapping the Hawking process to a quantum circuit. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So the first, let me do it for a, for a black hole only, uh, just for simplicity, and then I will go to the white black hole pair. So first of all, let me uh, identify what defines the Hawking effect, the Hawking process. So there are two things we need to keep in mind. Is that, first of all, a causal barrier creates entangled pairs of, of particles, of phonons or photons, whatever your system is. Entangled pairs, maximally entangled pairs. And second, if you look just one branch, you know, one side, and if you look different frequencies, the spectrum of just one uh, 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 side is a black body spectrum with a temperature given by the Hawking temperature. These two things, the quantumness are given are in this entanglement. So this entanglement has the quantum properties of the Hawking effect. Keep that in mind. But you know, if you are familiar with uh, quantum information and quantum optics, the creation of entangled pairs is what uh, uh, that community calls a process of two-mode squeezing. So one can understand the Hawking effect. Uh, one can say that the Hawking effect is actually a process of two-mode squeezing where the vacuum becomes a two-mode squeeze vacuum. Uh, plus that if you look different frequencies, the spectrum is black body spectrum. So this, this, these are the two elements, two-mode squeezing uh, with black body spectrum. Uh, 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 but uh, 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 so what I want to say is that the Hawking process can be understood as follows. 
Uh, I can do the two plots are, are equivalent, one using uh, uh, Penrose diagrams and the other just using standard diagrams. Uh, maybe I can go to the standard diagrams. So this is the event horizon of the black hole. Uh, uh, two modes start in the vacuum. The horizon acts as, uh, as a squeezer and creates a two mode, a squeeze vacuum, which is just pairs of maximal entangled quanta. One goes inside the black hole, the other wants to escape to infinity, but in the way uh, it needs to cross the potential, the gravitational potential barrier around the black hole. The black hole creates gravity and that is a gravitational potential. And therefore this mode, you know, part of it will be transmitted, part of it will be uh, reflected back. And, and, and you can think about this other mode in the vacuum. So these are the two processes in a Hawking process. Uh, a squeezer at the horizon, and then a beam splitter, because this is just a beam splitter. Part of the mode goes through, part of the mode gets reflected. So a squeezer and beam splitter, I claim, are the two uh, key elements of the Hawking process. And here I write mathematically what a squeezer, uh, how a squeezer acts on creation and annihilation variables, uh, just, just for curiosity. Um, so therefore, what I want to say is that the Hawking effect can be mapped to this quantum circuit, very quantum circuit, a combination of a squeezer and a beam splitter. Uh, the squeezer takes vacuum to two mode squeeze, there is entanglement here, and then this beam splitter splits the intensity and the entanglement between two, uh, 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 two channels, one channel that goes to infinity, the other channels that goes to to uh, uh, the black hole again. Uh, and you know, and just looking at the circuit, I can guess many things and I can do analytical computations in a extremely simple manner. I can tell you that this guy is entangled with these two guys and it's a matter of two lines to compute what entanglement is and what, you know, uh, entanglement entropy, logarithmic negativity, whatever measure you want can be analytically extracted from this circuit. So this is what I meant by mapping the Hawking process to a, a, a quantum circuit. And I want to claim that this is extremely useful to compute and to understand many aspects of the Hawking process. And I will show you several examples. So what about black hole and white hole together? Then we, uh, uh, it is simple because uh, remember a white hole is the time reversal of a black hole. So if I want the quantum circuit for a white hole, all what I have to do is to take the circuit, take the time reversal and put it together. And this is precisely what I want here. This is black hole circuit together with a white hole circuit. And I argue that this uh, 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 is the quantum circuit that reproduces the physics of a, of a white black hole pair. And 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 uh, there is a question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a small small clarification. So if the beam splitter is removed, then there is no Hawking effect, right? No, no. The uh, uh, the um, the beam splitter uh, is analog of the curvature, isn't it? The beam splitter is plays the role of the potential barrier. So you know that the the Hawking radiation emits the black hole. Yeah. You know, uh, leaves the black hole, but not all reaches infinity because there is a potential barrier that the Hawking radiation needs to climb and part is reflected, but part is transmitted. And so that but, is produced by the curvature, isn't it? Uh, is, but, but, but not by the horizon. Is, no, not uh, by the horizon, I'll say, of course. Right, so yeah. if the beam splitter is removed, what happens is that the Hawking radiation is exactly thermal, black body. Oh, okay. The beam splitter is just introducing gray body factors. Is telling you that not all radiation, not all the Hawking radiation reaches infinity, and it's purely classical. This is just uh, classical potential. The squeezer is what creates entanglement. This is what what the Hawking effect is coming from. Okay. By the way, it's very nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> uh, and thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, they helped me to clarify uh, points. Uh, uh, so I claim that this is the circuit for a white uh, black hole uh, uh, pair. And it depends on three parameters. One, 
RH is the intensity of the squeezers. I call it the Hawking squeezing, squeezing intensity. Uh, uh, phi is the squeezing angle of the squeezer, and theta is the what characterizes the, the beam splitter, uh, the, the, what tells you the transmission and reflection coefficients of the beam splitter. Um, uh, so this, this is the statement. This is the quantum circuit we are providing. Two questions that you may have. First of all, how, you know, I give you the circuit and how do I know what are the values of these parameters? Uh, and second, why should you believe me? How do we know that this circuit actually describes well the physics of, a, of, a, of a, a, you know, pulses moving on a optical fiber? Because you know, there is a lot of stuff going on. And I am telling you that that stuff can be a model described by this simple circuit. So why should you believe me? Why, how can we check that this actually describes the physics uh, that I want? This is where our second contribution comes and it's just numerical simulations. So essentially what we have done is to take the optical and nonlinear uh, stuff, simulate it in a computer, uh, you know, just doing numerical calculations, solving the equations of motion in a computer and, and you know, comparing with our circuit. Uh, because that comparison will tell us whether the circuit works well or not. And if it works well, will tell us what are the values of the parameters. So uh, we have used a model uh, uh, also described by Unru uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the medium. Uh, diamond in particular, uh, but, but can be true for other, for other media. And, 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 and this is just what I said. Uh, 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 from our simulations, we can compute uh, the evolution and we can extract the parameters. So this is just an example of what we obtain from the simulations. Uh, there is a lot of information here, but let me just focus on the red points. The red points are the value of the Hawking squeezing intensity. And I take this, the log of the hyperbolic cotangent square, because if the spectrum is Planckian, that should be a straight line. That combination for the Hawking Planckian spectrum should be a straight line. The red points are the result of the numerical simulations. And you see that it is perfectly, uh, you know, fits very well a straight line. So, so therefore, even before using the circuit, we just check that this, uh, this uh, UNRU's prediction of thermal radiation is true uh, uh, using numerical calculations. Uh, but then we check that the circuit description works extremely well. Uh, uh, I don't give you details here just because of time, but, but, but that's the point. Uh, uh, I was even surprised how well this circuit describes the physics of the problem. Uh, 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 you know, physically uh, it should, but, but it, it actually does very well. Um, and, and we also identify other effects due to dispersion and subtleties of the medium that, that I don't have time to describe, but they are in, in our paper. So, well, good. with the circuit and the numerics, we can, you know, we can confirm the circuit works well and extract the parameters. So now we have the circuit, we trust it and we can use it. So contribution three. The third contribution is to, in our arguments, we are gonna include two extra ingredients. That, you know, thermal noise, you know, ambient noise that you have in your lab and losses and inefficiencies in your detectors. Why I want to include this? Uh, I mean, one reason is obvious because these features are always present in real experiments. So we should take them into account. Uh, and second is because they are gonna play a crucial role. So they are gonna play a role more important than you, what you could believe in the quantumness of the Hawking effect. Uh, give me a second and I will explain why. So thermal noise, uh, I parameterize it by the ambient temperature. TE tells me how much thermal noise there is in my experiment and eta, give me losses or inefficiencies. Eta equal one is perfect experiment. 
no losses equals zero is uh, uh, you lose everything. Main message here is that these effects are extremely damaging for the entanglement generated in the Hawking effect. They are entanglement degrading effects. And this is very important because remember the entanglement brings, you know, carries the quantumness of the Hawking process. If we lose the entanglement, the, Hawking, the quantumness of the Hawking process is gone. Uh, uh, so this is why we focus on these on this, uh, this, uh, two features, because they are essential to keep track and to measure the quantumness of a Hawk, the Hawking process in the experiment. My statements can be summarized in this plot. Uh, so rather than showing you derivations, I'm going to show you a plot. Here in this plot, I focus on a Hawking pair, uh, the Hawking particle and the partner that in the ideal case, are maximally entangled. And, uh, and I, the color here is the amount of entanglement, which I measure using a quantity called the logarithmic negativity. This is just a quantifier of entanglement. And I study how entanglement changes when I change the, uh, the inefficiencies or the thermal noise. And you see that, for instance, if, you know, if, uh, if you increase the inefficiencies, entanglement decreases, 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 because you know, blue is a smaller entanglement and disappears. So in inefficiencies degrade entanglement. And that is quite amazing because you know, it's something very quantum. So if you give me two beams, beams that are entangled, just by losing a few photons, the entanglement disappears. So this is something quite uh, subtle from quantum mechanics and very important for these uh, processes that inefficiencies degrades the entanglement in a extremely uh, fast manner. And also thermal noise, you know, imagine you are, uh, you have no inefficiencies, you know, you have a lot of entanglement, you increase the thermal noise and, and whenever, you know, entanglement decreases and whenever the ambient temperature is twice the Hawking temperature, entanglement is gone. So therefore, be very careful that your experiment is, is extremely cold. Even if you stimulate it, if temperature, ambient temperature is large, you lose the entanglement. So extremely important message um, uh, for experiments, uh, uh, of course. So there is no way to look for the quantumness of the Hawking effect if you are working uh, in the wide area regime, the, quant the Hawking effect. Uh, the Hawking outputs are not entangled at all. They are classical. So very important for experiments. Conclusion, uh, 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 most experiments, for instance, water in a tank, which is an ambient temperature, work in a regime where Hawking entanglement is gone, is absent. So we'll go ahead and question. Uh, yeah, uh, just one again, small clarification. So when you say that the inefficiency is increasing, uh, destroys the quantumness of this. Is it the case of uh, signal being buried in noise or signal is actually absent? I mean, it's a yeah. little, uh, meaning the state may be entangled, but its effect are not manifested because the noise just uh, overwhelms it. Right. The statement is that if you have a, de a detector, <clears throat> yeah. if you have a detector, the de de sorry, the detector is not perfect. It cannot. Yeah. It's so it's going some... to detect both signal and noise, and noise is too large. That's what it meant. Right? But even if the answers of noise, so imagine that you have no noise, uh, oh. uh, uh, you have zero ambient temperature, just by missing a few of the photons, you will uh, the signal is not entangled with the other. Oh, okay. So you are saying it's really physical effect of destroying the entanglement. Exactly, exactly. So imagine we work at zero temperature, ambient temperature, so no noise. And you just decrease the inefficiency. Sorry, sorry. Increase, the inefficiency. increase the inefficiency. The entanglement decreases and eventually is gone. Okay. Okay. So, so the, and these are two independent factors: inefficiencies. Just by losing a few photons, the entanglement disappears, and and, and that is very quantum. Uh, I don't have That's an intuition yeah. for that. And of course, the other is more natural. If you have noise, the noise over shines sure. the signal and therefore the entanglement is gone. Uh, uh, 
so these are the two the two uh, messages. Uh, uh, these effects degrade the entanglement. So most experiments have been done in regimes where entanglement is gone. So I fully agree with them that the experiments are classical, but for this reason that it was not identified before. And we can identify it because this circuit, this circuit is so uh, useful that this can be done analytically. Uh, that, that, that is the uh, why we were able to, to notice this. If you don't have the circuit, uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy to realize uh, these effects, but with the circuit, this becomes um, uh, a simple exercise. Contribution four, and this is my last contribution. <clears throat> we have done a detailed analysis of the output uh, 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 of the signal for different inputs. <clears throat> In fact, we were wondering, okay, let me come back. Uh, entanglement gets degraded by noise, uh, noise and inefficiencies. Is there a way to uh, revival the entanglement? Is there a way to amplify the entanglement so the losses are compensated? And that is the answer is yes. If we choose appropriate inputs, I mean, if we illuminate, if we stimulate the process with appropriate inputs. And these are the conclusions. It happens that if you illuminate the system with a coherent state, remember coherent state is a laser or any classical radiation is a coherent state. Uh, the coherent state, if you go to the quantum formalist and you study the first moments, you know, the expectation values of the creation or annihilation operators, just fair moments, are different from zero, but the second moments are the same as the vacuum. So the quantum fluctuations in a coherent state are the same as the vacuum. And because uh, uh, entanglement has to do with the second moments, uh, uh, this tells me immediately that for a coherent state, you are not going to increase the entanglement because uh, uh, second moments are the same as for the vacuum. Anyway, um, uh, the message here is entanglement in the final state is the same as if you had used a vacuum input. So with the circuit, we obtain that if you use coherent states to stimulate the process, as it was done in experiments, intensities are amplified, but no entanglement is extra entanglement is generated. This explains why, you know, this explains or provides an explanation for the previous claims by Unruh and Leonhardt and other people that stimulating the process with coherent states is a purely classical experiment. But we add that changes if you choose a different input. If you use an input in which the second moments are different from zero, you can also amplify the entanglement. And we find that using one mode squeezed states illuminating the black hole with squeeze states uh, uh, is able to increase, to amplify not only the intensities, but also the entanglement and to compensate for the losses uh, produced by, by noise and inefficiencies. So this is just a plot. Uh, there is a lot of information here, but just this is log negativity, which is a measure of entanglement in a Hawking pair in the final state as a function of the initial squeezing intensity. So moving to the right here is increasing the squeezing in the input. And if you take one curve here, this tells you that the entanglement in the final state increases as you increase the initial squeezing. And remember, the initial is single mode squeezing. There is no entanglement in the initial state. So all entanglement is produced by the Hawking process. And this, this, this plot tells you that you can stimulate, you can amplify the final entanglement if you are clever and use appropriate quantum inputs rather than coherent states. And this increase seems uh, very small, but this is a log, log scale. So, so this increase is, 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 is significant. And in particular, it can overcome the, the degradation due to noise and, and, and inefficiencies. Oh, one more contribution, uh, but this is the this is truly the last one. 
we have proposed a protocol to amplify and observe this quantum aspect. So we have proposed an experimental protocol to go to the lab and measure the things to extract the two predictions of the Hawking effect. Entanglement, uh, you know, two mode squeezing, and thermal uh, black body uh, spectrum for the output. And, and in our protocol, we propose to illuminate the white hole uh, with this mode, is called K3, uh, uh, in a, put it in a two, uh, sorry, put it in a one mode, a squeeze state, illuminate and observe K1 and K4 emitted by the white hole. This is a Hawking pair. And our statement is that measuring the entanglement in this Hawking pair as a function of the initial squeezing, one can, in one stroke, uh, test the two predictions of the Hawking effect. The quantumness, because one is measuring uh, entanglement. And second, uh, uh, the, the Planckian spectrum of, of the outputs. Uh, uh, and I don't want to bother you with the questions. Uh, we can go over them if you have questions. But 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 the message is that the message is in this plot that that you know uh, uh, you know imagine that black dots are experimental results. You know entanglement as a function of the initial squeezing for a single frequency. Of course, this is for a single frequency, uh, uh, and these uh, lines are theoretical curves for different values of the Hawking squeezer intensity. So matching theory and experiment, you know that in your experiment, the Hawking intensity is 0.63. And if you do that for different frequencies, you, you can measure, you can confirm whether this Hawking intensity corresponds to a Planckian spectrum or not. Therefore, in a single measurement, a single protocol, you can check the entanglement and the Planckianity, so, so the two main aspects of the Hawking effect. So let me uh, uh, stop here. Let me just uh, write the uh, read the conclusions for you. Um, um, so the conclusion is that, um, 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 uh, that using this circuit, uh, one has a simple, a simple, you know, mapping the process, the Hawking process, which is complicated, remember, it's just waves propagating on the top of waves. And, and, but our statement is that that can be described in a simple, generic, and powerful manner uh, using quantum circuits uh, made of squeezers and beam splitters. Um, um, uh, we have done numerical simulations, and, and, and they are also very powerful because they, I mean, they are just simulations of the process uh, with no assumptions. So they can tell you what the parameters are, you know, identify subtle effects having to do with uh, dispersive effects in the crystal, the limitations of the analogy with gravity, et cetera. And we have uh, studied all that. Um, uh, we have combined both to identify and quantify what are the quantum aspects of the Hawking process and to delimit the region where these quantum aspects survive or not uh, uh, in a concrete experiment uh, using, you know, uh, because of the degradation produced by noise and inefficiencies. And second, we have uh, uh, claimed that it is not true that the stimulated process is classical. It is classical only if you use classical inputs. If you use quantum inputs, the stimulated process also amplifies the quantum aspects. So I want to claim that this stimulated process is a very promising avenue to measure the Hawking radiation in the lab in a control manner, because you can tune the initial input to tune how much you amplify different aspects. So uh, 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 I want to push this idea uh, uh, and claim that this is one of the best avenues we have to confirm Hawking and Unruh's ideas to confirm this uh, deep relation, profound relation between coastal barriers and, and thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. And I want, I want to stop here. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Agullo, for such a nice uh, talk.